I am uh, glad you are here. I woke up this morning in, in a daze. I was very groggy. I was at a youth uh, conference at Grace Church uh, Friday and all day Saturday, and I woke up, and I stumble into my kitchen. I get a drink of water, and I look at the clock on my oven, and it says 5.30 a.m., and I go, what in the world? Why am I awake at this ungodly hour? What is going on? And then I was like, wait a minute, 5.30, I look at my phone, it's 6.30. I'm like, I gotta get ready for church. I almost went back to bed for an hour. Can you imagine the horrible things that would have happened if I would have went back to bed for an hour? I'm preaching this morning. I, I would have missed some stuff. Uh, but uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you did not go back to bed for an hour. Maybe some of you did, and that's why you're here at second service, but I'm glad you're here, and uh, man, the Lord, has, the Lord has some good things for us this morning, and I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy about that. Well, you never know what will happen next, do you? You know, disaster can strike at any time, including the moment when you least expect it. I have a couple reminders of that. Con- consider the curious case of Molaire, the French actor and playwright, and while performing the title role in the final scene of his own drama called The Hypochondriac, Molaire was seized by a violent coughing fit. And it's, as it turned out, his ailment was no imagination, and he died a few hours later. Or consider the fate of America's leading psychic, Gene Dixon. On January 2nd, 1997, Dixon predicted that a famous entertainer will leave a nation in mourning within weeks. And whether or not the, ma- the nation mourned or not, just three weeks later, Dixon herself died of a heart attack. And it's doubtful that she really ever saw it coming. Here's another example. Bob Cartwright was disappointed when he was unable to accept accept the invitation to fly to New York with his friend Tyler Stanger and the professional baseball player Corey Little for the playoff game between the Yankees and the Tigers. He felt differently, though, when he saw the news about Stanger and Little and that they had crashed into an apartment building and both died. I was supposed to be on that plane, Bob Cartwright said. Yet just one month later, one month, Bob Cartwright died in another plane crash near his mountain home in California. Then the, there's another Donald Peters who bought two Connecticut lottery tickets on November 1st, 2008, just as he did for 20 years. Every day he'd buy a lottery ticket, or every week he'd buy a lottery ticket for 20 years. And as it turned out, one of his lottery tickets was worth $10 million. How fantastic is that? He won the lottery. But Peters was not as lucky as one might think because he died of a heart attack later that very day that he bought the winning lottery ticket. And then lastly, think of Rodney Clark. He was married to his wife, Judy, for 20 years, a marriage that was filled with dancing and joy. But on March 5th, 2022, yes, that's right, just about a week or so ago, Rodney laid on top of his wife in the bathtub to shield her from the deadly tornado that shredded through their Madison County home about 45 miles away from here. Judy survived, but Rodney lost his life. In his final act of love, he died a hero. None of these unfortunate, unexpected events would have surprised the preacher who wrote our book of Ecclesiastes. Time and chance happens to us all, he says. Man does not know his time. Please turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 9 as we'll be finishing out chapter 9 in our study. We've been in this series looking through Ecclesiastes for 11 weeks now, if you can believe it or not. And this sermon series will take us up to Palm Sunday where we'll we'll take a break and celebrate Palm Sunday, celebrate Easter, uh, Resurrection Sunday morning, and then the Sunday after that we'll dive back on in after finishing Ecclesiastes dive back on into our study in the book of Genesis, which we took a break from and ended that series back in September. And so hopefully by now you are in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. We'll be looking 
uh, in verses 11 through 18. If you remember last week, Pastor Todd ended his message with looking at verses 11 and 12. We will start our text this morning in verse 11 because it acts as a good hinge passage, both to end a message on and both to begin a message on. And so hopefully you're in your Bibles. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. I'd encourage you to follow along or listen along as I read out loud Ecclesiastes chapter 9, beginning in verse 11. The words of the preacher. Again, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle belongs to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all, for man does not know his time. Like fish that are taken in an evil net, like birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor, wise man. And he had his wisdom, and he by his wisdom, rather, delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. The words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Bow with me as I pray, please. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Lord God, guide us now in this time, in this place. Some of us are tired. Some of us are weary. Some of us are bogged down with the trials of life. Help us to see clearly now in this time what you have for each and every one of us from your holy word. Direct our attention to the text and its application to our lives. And Father, may your name be praised forevermore and forevermore in this time. And Lord God, comfort Comfort our dear friend and church member, Carolyn Brewer. Lord, restore her health. Bring her back to us. Father, take any pain away from her body. And Lord, let your will be done in that time. All God's people said, Amen. Excuse me. I have four points for us to walk through this morning. And the first one is this, time and chance. Time and chance. Verses 11 through 12. Once again, Ecclesiastes confronts us with one of the many frustrations of living in a fallen and broken and sinful and desperate world. Two weeks ago in chapter 8, Ryan reminded us, and then last week, earlier in chapter 9, we learned that good things do not necessarily always happen to good people. Chapter two, verse, rather, chapter 9, verse 2, the same event happens to the righteous and also the wicked. And when he said this, the preacher was talking in moral categories, and the same thing happens to everyone, whether good or evil, the same thing will happen to everyone. And then verse 11 takes the same basic principle and applies it to people's various talents. Now, ordinarily, we would expect things to go very well for people who are strong or people with many talents, people who are smart, people who are, are, are good at doing things, and often th- those things do go well for those types of people. But having speed or having strength or having smarts does not guarantee success. And the preacher mentions five kinds of people that one would expect to be winners in this lifetime, but sometimes turn out to be losers. 
Usually the fastest person wins the race, but not always. Think of the situation of the tortoise and the hare. Or to give a little well-known example from 2 Samuel, think of Asahel and Abner. Asahel was as fast as a gazelle, the Bible says, and when he pursued Abner in battle, um, Abner had no chance to defeat him. But Abner did have a weapon, and he knew how to use it, and so when Asahel overtook him, Abner impaled Asahel with the spear. Speaking of battles, usually the strongest man always comes out on top, but think of David and Goliath. Think of David and Goliath, and it gives hope to the underdog. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to Selection Sunday later this afternoon with the NCAA tournament. Hope for the underdog. I'm all for that. The Olympic slogan says, Sitius, Alutus, Fortius, meaning swifter, higher, stronger. But the race is not always won by the swift, nor the battle is not always won by the strong. And then the preacher augments this list of physical attributes by mentioning several different intellectual abilities. Ordinarily, we would expect someone with a superior mind to be worth a fortune, right? Or at least be able to make a good living. But when the markets crash, even the sharpest of financial advisors and minds suddenly realize they don't know much at all. At the same time, some of the people living at a homeless shelter might find themselves to be extremely smart. What the preacher says is true. The wise do not always have bread. Intelligence does not guarantee a good living. And having a lot of knowledge does not necessarily do us any favors. Human ability is no guarantee of success in life. Disaster can and most likely will overtake all of us at a certain time in our life, and the preacher says time and chance happen to us all. This phrase does not deny the sovereignty of God, friends. We know that God works all things according to the counsel of his will, and everything is under his wise provision and guidance and sovereign control. What happens in life is not arbitrary, therefore, but is subject to God's authority. From our perspective, however, there still is a problem. There is a problem. We do not necessarily know what God is doing all the time. No matter how strong we are, no matter how smart we are, many bad things will happen to us in life. And there is no way for us to predict what will happen. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 tells us that there is a time for everything. And here we see we do not even know when that time for everything is. Man does not know his time. And the preacher illustrates illustrates this truth with a pair of vivid images from nature like fish that are taken in an evil net, like birds that are caught in a snare. So the children of man are snared in an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. And the fish and the birds that are caught, they're caught before they know it. If they knew they were going to be caught, they would have turned around and headed in the opposite direction. And by the time they are trapped, it's too late to escape. The same thing happens to people. Time and chance happen to us all. The word time may refer generally to the seasons of life, but in the words of Martin Luther, he says this, you should understand time here, not to refer only to the end of life, but to every appointed time and outcome. The time will come when events will overtake us. Before we know it, we will get trapped in a bad situation at work. Family will be afflicted with a fatal disease or caught in a fatal financial tsunami. And at the very end, of course, the time will come for all of us to die and to go to judgment, a time that only God knows, but we do not. And if time doesn't overtake us, dear friends, certainly chance will. This word does not mean something like fate or gambling, but refers to an occurrence, something that happens to us in this life. The rest of verse 12, which talks about an evil net and an evil time, it is clear that the preacher is talking about chance, and it's not good, it's bad. Something bad that's going to happen to us. 
And in a fallen world, many unhappy things happen all the time, every day. Natural disasters, environmental catastrophes, military conflicts and economic downturns. Life is unpredictable. Its misfortunes are inevitable and often inescapable. What a way to start a Sunday morning, amen? Couple things, we're all gonna die. We don't know when. Lots of bad thing, things are going to happen to us and we don't know what those things are. What a joyful, cheery way to get all pumped up for church this morning. Don't worry, I'm not gonna leave you there. There's good news. Point number two, wisdom exemplified. Wisdom exemplified, verses 13 through 15. How should we respond then since we know the evil day is coming, since we know bad things are going to happen to us in life, since we know that there is uncertainty lurking behind every corner and alleyway, what should we do? Well, at some point, some people, maybe some of you in this very room are sitting here and be like, what's the point? What's the point? Some people are tempted to just give up and to think there's nothing we can do than just to resign ourselves to fate and let the chips fall where they may. If the race does not always go to the swift, then why run at all? If the battle is not always won by the strong, then why prepare for war? If getting smart will not make you more money in life, then why bother to develop your mind? Since it all comes down to chance anyway, fatalism might appear to be the only honest option. But the preacher gives a different response. He commends the relative value of earthly wisdom, telling us to live wisely. And the preacher does this first by giving us examples of, an example of someone wise in verses 13 through 15, and then by comparing that wisdom to several less advantageous alternatives in verses 16 through 18. So here's the preacher's example in verse 13. Look, pick back up your copy of God's Word. Look with me right here First, or excuse me, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 13. I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it, and I love this, a poor, wise man. And he had his wisdom, and he, by his wisdom, delivered the city, yet no one remembered the poor man. It was something the preacher had seen for himself. This is not a made-up illustration. This is not a a parable. There's a poor man who was wise enough that saved an entire city. Some Some scholars have tried to determine where precisely in history this happened. Certainly we know stories from the Bible that are similar to this. In 2 Samuel, we read about a wise woman who saved the city of Abel by sacrificing the life of one evil man. Wise King Hezekiah saved Jerusalem a different way by praying for God's deliverance. There are examples from ancient history as well. Archimedes reportedly saved Syracuse from the Romans by sinking all of the Roman ships before the battle even began. Sometimes one man is wise enough to save a metropolis. And in this particular case, the preacher does not tell us how he did it, nor are we likely to figure out who this person is, because verse 15 tells us no one remembered this guy anyway, so it's folly to even try to figure out who this individual is. Yet the fact remains that his wisdom saved the city. The preacher saw the city's deliverance as something great, in the sense that it is significant or that it taught an important lesson for us to learn today. The city had almost no chance to survive. Its defenders were totally outnumbered by the conquering army. This enemy is led by a powerful king with the latest military technology. Humanly speaking, this city did not have a prayer. But Ecclesiastes tells us the battle is not always won by the strong. And in this particular case, one man knew exactly what to do. And for the preacher, this was an example of what wisdom can do. And so thirdly, we see wisdom prioritized. Wisdom prioritized, verses 16 through 18. Admittedly, the man who saved this particular city is soon forgotten. Here we see again the realism or maybe pessimism of Ecclesiastes. 
Despite the good deed that this guy had done, no one remembered this guy's name shortly after because people are fickle and fame is fleeting. There are examples of this in the Bible as well. Think of Joseph and Pharaoh's butler when they're in prison. Joseph interprets the butler's dream about how he's going to be released from prison. And Joseph says, listen, butler, I only ask one thing of you. Just remember me when you get out and tell Pharaoh about me that he can release me. What did the butler do? Instantly forgot about him the second he was released from jail. Joseph spent another several years in prison and then was let go. Think of Mordecai from the Old Testament, uncovered a plot against King Ahasuerus, but at the time he did not receive a single reward. People are like that. Life is like that too. Even life-saving wisdom is often forgotten. Yet wisdom still has its advantages. Yes, human wisdom has its limitations. It may not make any of us famous. It will not guarantee us a fortune in this life. But it is relatively valuable nonetheless. People may forget who gives them wise counsel. They may even refuse to listen to wise counsel. But wisdom is still better than the alternative. And the preacher proves this by making several comparisons. In verses 13 through 15, wisdom was exemplified. In verses 16 through 18, wisdom is prioritized. And fortunately, the poor man who saved the city was able to get the people to listen to the wise words or things he had to say. It does not always work out that way, though. Many of you are older than me in this room. I don't got to tell you about this. You come to a dear loved one, you come to a dear friend, a dear, a dear family member who seems to just be messing up their life over and over and over again. And you say, listen, after a time of prayer, after a time of seeking the Lord, here are some things I think if you do these things that might help you get out of this pit of misery that you find yourself in. But this person always runs back to the pig trough over and over and over again in life. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Does anyone have someone in their life like that? Very good. This is all the more true when the words of the wise are heeded. And this is one of the preacher's main points in Ecclesiastes. If we are wise, we will listen to wise counsel. And this is the advantageous situation described in verse 17 and 18. It says this, The words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. And I find this last phrase sometimes troubling. But one sinner destroys much good. The last phrase of verse 18 is a sober reminder, friends. Reminder of the damage that one person can do, one sinful person, especially someone in power. Although wisdom, yes, has its advantages, we will say more about that in just a moment. It does not take much to spoil the good that wisdom might produce. Verse 17 describes a loud-mouthed leader. Yet we know that the loudest voice is not always the wisest voice. In fact, usually it's the opposite. We just have to look to American politics to see that. Can I get an amen? This particular man gets his own way by shouting everyone else down. Not that his advisors would give him any sort of better counsel. This this guy who's shouting is surrounded by fools. It happens all the time. A man tries to rule his family, run his business, take control of a church by just throwing his weight around usually doing a lot of yelling in the process. How easy is it for one proud or angry man to wreck a marriage or divide a church? I've seen it happen, and I'm sure you have too. There's a better way to lead. However, and the preacher commends it to us. A wise man does not feel the need to do a lot of shouting. He knows that it's, it's not the loud word that moves people's hearts for good. It's not the loud word that changes the world. It's the soft, quiet words of godly wisdom that do such a thing. I've been a parent for four years now. I have two little girls. One is four years old. Pray for me. One is uh, one and a half. 
pray for me. Um, many of you have decades of parenting experience. I'm not telling you guys anything new. It's something I'm learning, right? I can raise my voice and lose my temper with my children as much as I want, and yes, it'll get, it'll get somewhere, but I can't tell you how beneficial it is in a moment of quiet to come and sit next to my kids and just have a conversation, to sit here and talk about, you didn't know you were going to be part of the sermon today, did you? Welcome. They're not that bad, trust me. To sit here and have a talk about how to honor the Lord. To, to sit next to my, my daughters and, and talk about why they need to obey mommy and daddy. To talk about what it means to live for God as a four-year-old. It's interesting how that works. We can also apply this principle at home. You know, with apologies to Teddy Roosevelt, we might paraphrase verse 18 like this, speak softly and don't carry a big stick, right? The preacher is not denying that there is time for war, nor is he denying the usefulness of weapons when it is time to fight, but he is saying that wisdom is superior to weaponry. We can apply this truth at at home, guys, where a few quiet words go so much further and honor the Lord than shouting. You know, I don't, I've learned this about my marriage, too. I've been married for eight years. Some of you are like, rookie. <laughs> Talk to me when you get up in the 30 ballpark, right? You know, the once a year when my, me and my wife get into an argument, right? Like the one, the one time a year. That's a joke. Oh, come on, guys. You got, you got to stay with me, right? <laughs> let, me, let me try that again. The once a time me and my wife get in an argument every year, right? <laughs> Thank you for humoring me. You guys are so nice. I've learned in my marriage... And again, I'm not telling some of you, not, you guys are like, yeah, I know this. I've learned in my marriage, I can, I can raise my voice, lose my temper, shout, throw my weight around, do, be angry, do all that stuff. That only goes so far. You know what I've learned really helps? The soft-spoken word of loving kindness to my spouse. Hey, this is what I'm thinking I'm sorry, I, 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 please forgive me for this. Th- this is what I was thinking in this moment. I, I meant this when I said it this way. Instead of loud, boisterous talking that makes people defensive, right? We can apply this to church where between us an honest conversation and genuine communication usually help avoid major conflict Some of you church people, man, you've been going to church your whole life. Some of you have seen some church wars where it gets ugly. I've seen some church wars too. I'm so thankful for the healthiness of Ankeny Free Church, aren't you? I am so thankful that we have a healthy, thriving church together. It's good. We need to continue to foster that good and honest, Lord-honoring conversation, genuine communication that helps us avoid conflict. We can also apply this principle to the government of cities and nations. And there, yes, there is a time of war. The preacher told us that back in chapter 3. But even the weapons of war are used best by someone who listens to wise counsel. Wisdom is always better. Last point, point number four, and then we're done. Wisdom applied. Wisdom applied. How then should we live? Especially in a broken, fallen world where time and chance happen to us all. Life is uncertain. Yes, we're going to suffer. Yes, we're going to encounter hardships and they could come at any moment. Even if we are swift, we possibly will lose the race. Even if we are strong, we probably might get defeated in battle. Even if we are smart, we may suffer poverty. Nor do we know how much time we have left in this realm. So what is the wisest way for us to to use the time we have left, having seen wisdom exemplified and prioritized, how should we apply this wisdom that the preacher is giving us from Ecclesiastes chapter 9? The first and foremost and most important thing we can say, friends, is to give our lives to Jesus Christ. This means asking him to be our savior, praying that he will forgive our sins by the blood that he shed on the cross. It means submitting our life to Christ as Lord, offering our whole life as a service to him. And yes, I said whole life. Not part of your life. Not Sunday morning for an hour and a half when you're here doing church. 
not Wednesday night when you're in Awana or in student ministry or in community group on Thursday night or whatever it is, your whole life. That means your bank account. That means your career choices. That means how you raise your kids. That means how you treat and love your spouse. That means what you do with the time God's given you here at church, uh, with your neighbors, in your community group, with other people. You give your whole life to Jesus and say, God, here I am. Use me however you want to use me in the context you've placed me. Ecclesiastes mainly looks at things from the perspective of human wisdom, which is valuable as far as it goes, but there's also divine wisdom, which alone can save us. The Bible says that the foolishness of God, so to speak, is wiser than man's wisdom. Now, the the Bible's not saying that God is foolish, but it's saying if God was foolish, even God's foolishness would be better than all of our wisdom combined. And if we want to be wise, therefore, we need the wisdom of God. And to get the wisdom of God, dear friends, is to simply ask for it. Don't you love the God we serve? There's no religious hoops to jump through. There's no, there's no go- going and, and doing X, Y, and Z. There's no, you have to be a certain type of Christian for X amount of years. There's no certain church attendance role that you have to have perfect attendance in. It's you simply just ask. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, I know I'm in that category. Anybody else with me this morning? No one. Everyone here has perfect wisdom. Wow, we should just pack up. Let's pray. We'll be done. Yes, we don't even need to hear the rest of the message. Does anybody lack wisdom this morning? Very good. I see those hands. The other 50% of you, man, you're going to be making some decisions. You guys are the smart ones in the room. James 1, 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. The primary way that God answers our prayer for wisdom is by giving us his son, Jesus Christ, whom the Bible identifies as the very wisdom of God. And one way to see the wisdom of Jesus, and I hope you see this, friends, is see how Jesus perfectly illustrates this story that the preacher told about a city saved by wisdom. Hopefully you're making that connection. You're seeing the Bible through your gospel lenses. Jesus was as poor as anyone. He was homeless. He was destitute, and therefore he was totally dependent on God for his daily bread. Jesus was also wiser than anyone as from all the wise things that he said in life. Even unsaved people go, yeah, Jesus was a very wise and moral teacher, but he's more than that. Jesus delivered us all by himself. How did he do it? He did it through something that seemed extremely foolish at the time, but actually turned out to be wise for your and I's salvation. And I say amen to that. Are you with me? Jesus saved our city of humanity by dying on the cross for our sins and then raising again on the third day. And giving our lives to Jesus Christ and all his wisdom is the wisest decision that anyone could ever do. And so now that our, to- our future is totally secure, if we trusted Christ, we know for certain that when we die, and we know we will die, in 80 years from now, this is a grim thought, in 80 years from now, most of us in this room will be dead if the Lord tarries. We know that for certain when we die, we'll go to heaven if we know Jesus as Lord and Savior. We also know that whatever happens in life, We have a loving Lord and Savior to guide us and to help us and to care for us. And time and chance will happen to us all. But it all happens under God's control. Amen? Isn't that good? When we trust in him, therefore, we know that our lives are kept safe in the hands of our Savior, which is by far the wisest place you and I can ever be. I heard this story over the weekend of a Roman pastor named Joseph. Zahn, Joseph Zahn, a Roman pastor, in the late summer of 1977, Zahn was arrested by the Roman police, for Romanian police rather, for preaching the gospel. He said this, I told the interrogator, you should know your supreme weapon is killing me. My supreme weapon is dying, Zahn said. 
He said, here's how it works. And he's talking with them while they're torturing him. Can you imagine this scene? They're, they're torturing him and he's having this conversation about the gospel. Here's how it works, sir. You know how my sermons are on tape all over the country when you shoot me or crush me? Whichever way you choose, you only sprinkle my sermons of the gospel with my blood. And everybody who has a tape of one of my sermons will pick it up and say, I better listen to this guy again. He died for what he preached for. My sermons will speak ten times louder after you kill me, and because you kill me, in fact, I will conquer this country for God because you killed me. Go on and do it. They let him go. <laughs> they did not kill him, and they did not continue to persecute him because they did, not, they, did not, they did not want the gospel to spread ten times quicker like wildfire over the prairie. They let him go. And Pastor Joseph went on and preached the gospel. Do you have that sort of reckless abandon for your life for the gospel. Whatever it takes, Lord, use me. Jesus said, if you lose your life, you're going to find it. Do you have that mentality? I wish more Christians did. I wish more Christians had, you know what? I don't care about my bank account. I don't care about my retirement. I don't really care about my, 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 my vacation time. I don't care about my, my extracurriculars, my toys, my boats, my ATVs, my, my big fancy house, whatever it is. I just want to be used by God. Whatever he needs, Whatever the church needs, whatever God needs, whatever this missionary needs, whatever is needed, I'm going to do and use whatever God has given me for the gospel kingdom work with reckless abandon for my own life because at the end of the day, I know how everything turns out and if you kill me, you're just putting me in paradise in the presence of my Lord and Savior and I can't wait for that day. Sometimes when life gets hard, dear friends, I'm reminded of the truth, man, we're just one day closer to heaven. We're just one day closer to meeting our Savior. We're just one day closer to living in perfection in the presence of God. And once we give our lives to Jesus, there are many other things that are wise for us to do, especially in uncertain times. And here's a sort of self-examination quickly to help us look at our lives. This, this list that maybe we need to hear and obey. Some of us need to do a little reflection this morning. So we'll have a couple things. Number one, it's wise for us to be thankful. It's wise for us to be thankful. When trouble overtakes us, when we lose the race, we thought we were fast enough to win. When we lose the battle, we thought we were strong enough to fight. It's easy to get discouraged. Things may not be going very well at home, going very well at school, going very well at work. But if we are wise, we will remember to celebrate God's blessings every single day. We will thank God with joy, joy for the basic provision God has given us. At the same time, we also need to be content. We need to be content. When life has turned out to be a huge disappointment, and friends, sometimes it feels like that and our future seems uncertain, it is easy to complain about the things that God has not given us and the things that God has not told us, but wisdom is content with whatever God gives us and whatever God tells us in life. Either we can go through life grumbling and complaining like little children, or we can accept whatever God decides to do or not do because God is God and we are not. It's also wise for us to be prayerful. When's the last time you prayed a meaningful prayer? I'm not just talking the, the quick prayer you have before you scarf down a Chick-fil-A sandwich, right? Lord, bless this meal, amen. Some of you pray like that, and that's the only time you pray. That's how my, that's how my four-year-old prays. God, thank you for the food, amen. <laughs> When's the last time you sat down with, with God and you had some time with the Lord? Some meaningful time with the Lord. Not interrupted with your phone, not interrupted with your, with, your, with your whatever, but just had a talk with Jesus. A little talk with Jesus make, makes everything all right. The preacher also teaches us to be humble. We need to be humble. It's another port of, an important part of wisdom. Rather than, rather than putting confidence in our own abilities, whether physical or intellectual, time and chance is going to come to us all. And so why not decide to use our talents for Jesus instead of trying to climb the ladder of life? Whatever God wants. The 
preacher also encourages us to be generous. If we are wise, we're going to be generous. In difficult times, it's tempting to get tight pocket books, to not want to give things away, to hold on tight. But God has promised to bless the cheerful giver. And if we feel uncertain about the future, we should give more of our stuff away to the kingdom because only what is done for Jesus will last. You know the best financial investment you can ever make? Finan- investing in God's work. Not the, not the greatest stocks, not a, not a great Roth IRA, our, a Roth IRA. Investing in kingdom work which produces eternal dividends. Amen? Give to your church, give to missions, give to your neighbors, love those, be there for the widow, be there for the orphan. Wisdom is also faithful. If the swift and the strong do not always win, it's tempting to think that nothing we do matters, but wisdom teaches exactly the opposite. If the future is unpredictable, then we need to live with the results of what we do and let God be God and let God use it. Just be faithful. Just be faithful. Just be faithful. Just be faithful. That's one of the biggest things I've learned the last two years. Can I be real with you for a second? I've been real with you the whole message. I don't know why I said that. Can I be extra real with you, I guess? The last two years have been hard on everyone, right? We don't have to squander about that. It's been hard as a church staff. The last two years have been hard as a church staff. It's been hard on the elder board. It's been hard on everybody. I've learned that this is just God teaching me. JD, just be faithful. Let, let me worry about everything else. Just be faithful. Just, just show up. Just, just do the right thing. Just be faithful in what God's given you. Don't worry about conquering the hill. Don't worry about taking the next step. Don't worry about all the other extra things in life. Just be faithful and let God be God. And let God work everything out. I've had a lot less anxiety in my life when I live that way. I just let God be God. Whatever God wants to have happen, that's what's going to have that's what's going to happen, regardless of how worried I am about this thing. Just be faithful. And then as the worship team comes back up and as we close, all of this helps us to know how to handle life's setbacks and live with life's uncertainties and a practical down-to-earth example of this and then I'm, I'm done, I promise. It's from a missionary partner serving in the Muslim Middle East and I'm not gonna say her name. Her family had been going through a hard time in country and she knew how to handle these hard times wisely and in a letter to her supporters back home, she listed some of the hardships she was facing while ministering to Muslims in the Middle East as a missionary. But while she also listed the hardships, she listed right next to them a better and wiser way of looking at each circumstance. And I thought I'd read those to you quickly because it's a great way to look at life. She says this, deep spiritual oppression and harassment we're experiencing but we're privileged to shine as stars for Jesus in this inky black night. Our mail, our packages, wallet has been stolen, our phone is tapped. Great reminders that our lives are not our own. No longer do we have the convenience of a car. No longer do we have the expense of a car. And man, aren't you feeling that this week? Very dangerous driving conditions and traffic, man, but a good public transportation system to use. Tight and challenging times facing us now, but many, prayer, many opportunities to prayerfully trust God. The water that flows from our faucets is mud-colored, but sparkling, life-giving water flows from our lives. Many aggressive viruses and lingering illnesses are going around. I'm truly thankful for the Lord's healing hand. A cold apartment when we have the flu hot drinks, blankets, and prayer that warm us up. If we are wise, we will walk with God and look at life the same way. Thankful for our many blessings, content with what we have, prayerful about every difficulty, faithful in doing God's work, and hopeful about our future. 
even though we do not know how much time we have and we know that calamity can strike at any moment, we know we serve a big God that is bigger than our issues. And so let's live for Jesus and walk wisely in this wretched, wretched world. Bow with me as I pray. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for the truths from Ecclesiastes. Thank you for the preacher and his writing of this book. Father, help us to look to you in these difficult times. Help us to trust you. Help us to walk wisely. Help us to think about life through our gospel lenses, through eternity lenses that help us see the grand scheme of things. Help us to be joyful and not be upset at every small and insignificant thing in the grand scheme of eternity. Help us to know that we know how the world ends and we know that because of you, we end up victorious through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. Thank you for times like these. Thank you for my friends. Help us to live courageously this week for you in the face of adversity, in the face of trials, in the face of difficulties, in the face of depression, in the face of anxieties, in the face of, 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 of family hardships and, and sickness and all these things. Father, help us to live courageously for you. And whatever life brings us, know that you are good and that you have a good plan for our life. Father, thank you. All God's people said,